Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Going to get into another round of questions today. God's Word is so perfect. You even see in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4, you find out that the work of the Lord is perfect. And so many things are explained when you find out what the Bible actually says that are a mystery to so many people. Things just do not make sense, but if they would just get into the Word, it would make perfect sense. We're going to cover some of those things today. Let's go ahead and get into it. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Word. In this place you've given us, we can teach your Word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, precious name. Amen. All right, first question. You can go, you know you can go ahead and go. Yeah, you're fine. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. No, it's okay. Thank you. All right, no problem. All right, first question. We don't know this person's name. The Monte Verde site in Chile or Chile was dated to 14,800 years ago. The Buttermilk Creek complex in Texas was dated to about 15,500 years ago. The Bluefish Caves in Yukon, Canada have evidence of human activity as far back as 24,000 years ago. I was wondering if we are to assume that structures older than 13,000 years ago are from the first Earth age. If so, do we have a timeline for this, or can we even have a timeline for this? And no, not really. I mean, those places that you're referring to, they, they claim that they are all these like primitive tools. And understand, we didn't need primitive tools in the first Earth age. But in many of those things that they claim to be primitive tools, probably of them are, many of them are probably just rocks. But people always want to push the narrative of evolution. But of course, evolution is a complete lie. But what is a blessing is that we do know that there was an earth age before this. That the earth is millions of years old. And in some of those places that you mentioned, they, are, they speak of um, animal fossils that are men, very, very, very old, thousands and thousands of years old. And of course, that, that would be correct because animals were in flesh in the first earth age. That's why we have like the dinosaur bones that are millions of years old because the earth is millions of years old. But we were not in flesh bodies in the first earth age. We were in our spiritual bodies. And then you find out in Ezekiel 28 that Satan rebelled and he convinced a third of God's children to follow him, like you see in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. So God destroyed that first earth age. He destroyed that dispensation of time that you can read about in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23 through 26, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, as well as other places. But... We can't, and, and you were kind of making the guess about 13,000 years ago being the day of the Catabo, the destruction of the first earth age. And that's simply, that would be no more than a guess. And I know what your mindset was to that, but that we just don't, we, no, we can't have an exact timeline for that. We just don't know. But so what is a good idea is just to stick to the facts. We know there was a first earth age. We know we were in spiritual bodies and we know that Satan rebelled there. And then uh, and that's when the elect were chosen. It was in the first earth age like you read about in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, Romans chapter 8 verses about 26 through 33. God's elect stood against Satan in the first earth age. So that's why they were chosen as one of God's elect. Because God knows that he can trust them. So let, let's just try to stick to the facts there. Of course, it's interesting. You know, I mean, like I said, an, animal fossils are very interesting, of course, because they do take you back thousands, even millions of years ago. But so the exact date timeline like that, no, I would not be comfortable trying to be exact on anything like that necessarily. But we know there was a first earth age. And so let's just stick to the facts. And I, I hope I was able to answer that question. I answer that to the best of my ability. I hope that helped. And um, I will mention that we do have a study uh, called Three World Ages. 
It's number 9.8, and that will go into incredible detail about the first Earth age, and then the age that we are in now, the second Earth age, and the third Earth age, which is the eternity of Revelation chapter 21 and 22. We don't know this person's name either. Is Matthew chapter 22, verse 8 now or the millennium? Now, Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 8 is basically speaking about the first advent of Jesus Christ, how he was rejected. But now let's read uh, verses 8 and 9 of Matthew chapter 22, and it says, Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So that would be referring to now. Whomsoever will, anyone that will accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, they're, they're bidden to the wedding. But then you would go down to, when you get down to about verse 11, you'd see when the wedding comes, which of course that would be at the return of our Savior Jesus Christ, says you got a guy in there, he doesn't have a wedding garment on. So then it was said to him, why, why, how, how are you in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then he says, bind him hand and foot, cast him into outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So then a person in that type of situation would have to go through the millennium, that thousand year teaching period of Revelation chapter 20. So that is the time frame that that was referring to there. That, that, and you understand the guy with the wedding that did not have the wedding garment, he thought he was in good standing, but he wasn't. And so that wedding will take place at the second advent, that time when it's time for Jesus Christ to return. And then shortly after that will be that thousand year teaching period of Revelation 20. We'll be talking a little bit more about that thousand year teaching period in a later question. Um, Isaiah, we don't know where Isaiah is from. When the sealing of the 144,000 is complete and there's still more souls that have to be born of the flesh, are the three woe trumpets going to happen or does every soul have to be born of woman despite if the sealing is done? And what you always want to remember is God is in complete control. God chooses the exact second that every soul is born. God chooses, God is the one that puts the seal in the 144,000's mind, in their forehead. So it kind of seems like you're looking at it in the way like, oh, well, if this happened, if the 144,000 are sealed, but there's still more that need to be born, then God's going to have to shuffle things around. And, you know, no, God chooses the exact moment for all those things. So just trust in Almighty God. His timing is perfect for all those things. And I will read, I'm going to read here Revelation chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, and Daniel chapter 7, verse 2 and 3, which refers to the things that you're thinking of, with the, or that you're talking about, the 144,000 being sealed and so forth. So Revelation chapter 7, verse 2 and 3 says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So the end is not going to come until that 144,000 has the truth sealed in their mind. And now Daniel chapter 7, verses 2 and 3 says, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. And many things in, Rev in Daniel chapter 7, later in the chapter, God interprets it for you. I will mention in verse 17, I'll let you know those four beasts are four kings. Melissa, we don't know where Melissa's from. I thought in one of the books, obviously here in the Bible, that God had shaken this earth once and he will shake it again. And this is referring to the first earth age. And when it says it will shake it again, it's referring to the future. Um, do you know if there's a scripture like that in the Bible? And you are thinking of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 25 through 27. I'll read it here. I have it written down. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, 
How much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain, such as God's word and those who stick to God's word. You won't be shaken. You're on that solid foundation on the true rock, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But that shaking will come at the second advent of Christ. He's coming to set everything right. And then at the end of the millennium, those who follow Satan at that time, at the end of the thousand years, they will die the second death and their soul will perish. Like you see in Hebrews chapter 12, the last verse, it says, For our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. We don't know this person's name. What does Malachi chapter 4 verse 6 mean? Uh, last verse of the Old Testament. Um, I'm going to read here in Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6. And it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So this is letting us know that before Jesus Christ returns at the second advent, Elijah is going to return. And now considering this second part of this verse, this is quoted in Luke chapter 1. Now, we're going to be reading about John the Baptist. I'm going to read Luke chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. And it's going to be talking about John the Baptist. Let's see what it says. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. Elias is Elijah. So the point is that John the Baptist and Elijah do basically the same thing. John the Baptist was the forerunner to prepare the way for the first advent. Elijah is the forerunner to prepare the way for the second advent. And then continuing, so I'm just going to start this last sentence over. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So as John the Baptist did that for the first advent, Elijah's going to do that for the second advent. He's going to prepare people for the return of the Savior Jesus Christ. But you see, in, if, in people, those who do not turn to Jesus Christ, and those who do not turn to the true Father, yeah, God's going to smite them with a curse. God's wrath is going to come down. So you remain loyal to the true Father because the false father is coming, Satan, when he arrives as the false god. And that deception happens first, before we're gathered together to Jesus, to Jesus Christ. That's going to come up again as well in these questions. Bonnie, we don't know where Bonnie's from. I believe the great tribulation slash thousand years wrath of God is Jacob's trouble. And that is completely wrong in every way. The great tribulation is the tribulation of Satan as the false Christ. I'm going to read here in Matthew chapter 24, verses 21 through 24. It says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except these day, those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for, for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Does the millennium need to be shortened for the elect's sake? Of course not. The elect are priests and will teach and reign with Jesus Christ through that thousand years. But the tribulation of the false Christ is shortened for the elect's sake because the, his tribulation is that convincing. Um, then continuing on. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders and so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. But it's not possible. But the tribulation is that deceiving. Satan's deception as the false Messiah. If the time was not shortened, even the elect would be deceived. The thousand year teaching period of Revelation 20 is not a thousand years of, of wrath. 
That's not what it is. It's a time of salvation. I mean, it's a time to rejoice. Christ has returned. It's a time of teaching. It's a time of mercy to give everyone the opportunity to accept Christ as their Savior. And yes, you see in Zechariah 14 that those who refuse to come to Jerusalem and worship the Lord, then wrath, God's wrath is going to come down on them. But God's wrath, such as the vials of Revelation 16, you read about God's wrath there. God's wrath at the second advent of Jesus Christ, that's only going to last maybe 10 minutes. Such as 100 pound hailstones coming down, Ezekiel 38, Revelation 16. That wrath is not a thousand years long. That is so false to say that. I mean, have you ever read Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48? That teaches you all about the thousand year teaching period of Revelation chapter 20. You see there in Ezekiel 45, it speaks about how we'll celebrate the Passover. We'll celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Ezekiel chapter 46 verse 9 and 10 says, The people of the land shall come before the Lord in solemn feasts, and the prince is in the midst of them. When they shall go in, he sh the prince shall go in. And when they go forth, the prince shall go forth. And that prince is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember Ezekiel chapter 34, about verses 23 and 24, and Ezekiel 37, about verse 23 and 24. Also, Zechariah chapter 14, which I just mentioned, in verse 16 it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And of course, I have to mention Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. I'm going to mention one more scripture here, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 15. It says, So shall he sprinkle many nations. The king shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. All the people in many other countries that were never even taught Jesus Christ they will be taught. I mean, they were never even taught about Christ. So you think God's going to bring wrath down on them for a thousand straight years? Of course not. That's not what the millennium is. And yes, there will be wrath for those who still deny God at that time. You see that in Zechariah 14. But the millennium is a time of salvation, of mercy, and of teaching. Satan's locked in the pit for that whole thousand years with no influence but as I mentioned, he, well, I didn't necessarily mention this, but Satan will be let out of the pit at the end of the thousand years for one final chance to convince people to follow him. And as I did mention, those who choose to follow Satan at the end of the thousand years, they will die the second death and their soul will perish. Remember also Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Jeff from Indiana. Why would you choose that name for your church? And so in Revelation, and we're called Smyrna Christian Church, in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, you have seven churches there. There was only two that God was pleased with. The church of Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, and the church of Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 7, verse 13. I want to make something clear. We are certainly not saying we are the church of Smyrna of that of Revelation 2 or anything like that. We are called the church of Smyrna because you have to know what is written in the scriptures concerning Smyrna and Philadelphia in those chapters. You have to know who the Kenites are. Those who claim to be Jews but do lie and are of the synagogue of Satan. And you have to know that the false Christ is arriving first. You have to know that it's your job to stand against him and to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. You have to know that when you refuse to worship Satan when he's here as the false God, that you're going to be cast into prison for ten days. But you are protected. It says there that in uh, Revelation 3, it says, I will keep you from the hour of temptation. That word keep, it means to protect. Doesn't mean you're going to be gone or anything like that. Your job is to stand against the false Christ. Mark chapter 13, verses 9 through 11. But you are protected because Satan's not tempting to you. 
And don't ever forget Daniel chapter 8, verse 25, where it says, Satan by peace shall destroy, or yeah, Satan by peace shall destroy many. And also remember Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20. And I want to also mention, and I have to, I want to mention two more things. So it, in throughout Revelation chapter 2 and 3, about seven times, I think at least, it says that you have to overcome. That means you got to do something. Stand against the wicked one. I also want to mention Romans chapter 16, about verses 16 and 17. It says, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Christy, we don't know where Christy's from. Did you say the word wherefore is only used in one other place, uh, 1 Thessalonians? And uh, no, that's not exactly what I said. And uh, Christy is referring to our video, uh, our teaching of Hebrews chapter 12, which that video is called 37.9. Remember what Christ went through. God corrects those he loves. Run the race. And what I mentioned in that video is in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the word that's translated wherefore in the English, that Greek word, that Greek word is toy garun. And that Greek word is only used two places in the Word of God. It, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and it's also used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 8, where it's translated as therefore. So when you see those types of things, like there's only a certain Greek or Hebrew word used only in two places, might do you well to check out those places and check out the connections concerning those chapters. So of course, know the word wherefore in the English is used so many times in the Word of God. But that Greek word toi gerion, only two times in the Word of God. One more question. Um, Peggy, we don't know where Peggy's from. I, I wanted to mention this. I just clicked in my mind. I, I, going back to the very first question, I hope that I mentioned Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 23 through 26 concerning the first earth age. I'm the, the, Concerning the destruction of the first earth age. I hope I mentioned it. I might have, but it just clicked in my head. I, I have to mention that because that's so important. Okay, now Peggy's question. This is the last one. You have said in previous lessons that Satan causes the deadly wound to come about and then heals it. I have never said that. It is not Satan that causes the deadly wound. It's not Satan who heals the deadly wound. He doesn't have that power. It's God that causes the deadly wound, and it's God that heals it. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39, the words of Almighty God. See now that I, even I, am He, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. So I wanted to make that abundantly clear, clear right off the bat. But then you continue. And we know that he cannot be a flesh man, that's true. But, we will, but will we see him in his spiritual being? Or will he disguise himself as a flesh man? Well, Satan can disguise himself as whatever he wants. We, and we, it is true that Satan has different roles. But Satan's going to disguise himself as Christ. He's going to disguise him, himself as God himself. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14? Remember 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4? What, what does that say? It says that, and you read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, we're not going to be gathered together to Jesus Christ except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Of course, that's Satan. And it says, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped, who sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Satan is going to claim to be God himself. And yes, of course, he is not a flesh man. He's described in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12. It says, Thou sealest up the sum. It says that he is full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And he truly is, and he is so beautiful. He's going to be performing such incredible miracles that he is going to convince almost the entire world that he is God. 
The Antichrist is not a flesh man. It is Satan himself. Do, do not ever, ever forget that. And uh, that deception, we already mentioned in Matthew 24, his deception is so great, if the time was not shortened, even God's elect would be deceived. So you continue to study, prepare to make that stand to, to stand against Satan and to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you, as you see in Mark 13. We mentioned so often, I have to mention it again, you know from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, that when the seventh trumpet sounds and it's time for Jesus Christ to return, Every single person is changed into a spiritual body. So if you're still in the flesh, Jesus Christ has not returned. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. In this place you've given us, we can teach your word. We just ask you to continue to give us understanding, not just for ourselves, but so we can share them with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the precious name. Amen. Christian Church in Kokomo, Indiana by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.